Yo, what is up? Welcome to Ninja Geek Games. Political tensions are rising, the economy is failing, and the nation is in disarray. And this is also true for Hegemony, a game of squeezing out every penny from the little guy, selling goods to the highest bidder, or just sticking it to the man, dealer's choice. In this game, you take on the role of a specific group of people in proposed bills, control the workforce, and lead your class to victory by gaining hard-earned victory points. Hegemony has already received three Golden Geek Awards, but does its complexity overshadow a great game, or is it a well-balanced and highly thematic representation of politico-economics. First up, this is a heavy game because each class or faction that you play as has different values, objectives, actions and ways to gain victory points. Due to this, you'll need to be fully aware of how the class plays as well as the other player's motives because every action has an equal and opposite reaction, meaning all classes are cleverly interwoven with regards to how they play. Together with various political agendas to keep track of, a busy board and quite literally a ton of components, you'll be forgiven for thinking this game may go way over your head. I did. But as you gradually break down the various aspects, you then piece together the mechanics of how each class begins to play out. Let's take a look. The board looks to be an eyesore, but is actually split into four main areas, one for each class and a few others to track various aspects. The working class generally make use of public companies that produce one of three resources that players can buy, and these include health, education and influence, and they also get paid for their troubles. The middle class have their own set of companies they can build, and these also produce the same resources as well as food and luxury items that they can use for themselves or sell. The capitalists are similar to the middle class with respect to building their own companies, but they're a little more valuable. Due to this, they'll often make use of this area for selling their goods for the big bucks. Ah, the state. This is their treasury where money from sold public services and taxes are held, and they get a special area that allows them to provide benefits to other classes during play. The state will also have to contend with national events in the form of cards that they need to control. Lastly, this is the politics table comprising seven different policies. Players can attempt to adjust these to change various aspects like setting the minimum wage workers receive, the cost of education and healthcare, and how much tax players need to pay to the state. Each class will have their own specific agendas that they'll want to keep in place to sway the game in their favour, and this can also provide a few endgame victory points. Each class gets their own player board to store goods and money earned over the game, but they also provide the main ways each class gets victory points, and I'll give a brief overview of these here. The working class has many tracks to record how many of their workers are in play, as the more they have, the more goods they can buy. Prosperity is increased by claiming and spending specific goods, and as the marker moves up the track, the working class gain victory points equal to the numeric value. They can also form trade unions if they have a number of workers in certain industries, and these provide both VPs and influence. The capitalist is all about the dollar. Earned revenue will in turn move to capital that increases their wealth and generates victory points as indicated on this track. Any goods produced by their companies are stored here, and these can be bought by other players at a cost dictated by the capitalist or sold to the foreign market. The middle class is a hybrid of the capitalists and working class, as they also need to increase prosperity, as well as store and sell goods, or make use of them. The state, on the other hand, need to keep things fairly balanced as certain actions taken in the game increase their legitimacy with other classes, and they'll gain victory points based on the location of these markers at the end of the round. The game comes with so many components, I could quite literally sit here all day and go over how each are used. These include goods and service tokens, class cards, business deals, as well as class specific items. Yes, it seems overwhelming, but don't worry, we'll get there. What I like about the game, and others may not, is how asymmetric the factions are. I'll go into the basic mechanics of each class shortly, but what you'll notice is that some factions do overlap, and this will become more apparent when I discuss gameplay. Hegemony is played over five rounds, and within each there are a number of phases. There's an upkeep phase where you pay interest on loans, draw action cards, and some classes will also get workers looking for employment. During the action phase, all classes get to play cards from hand to take specific actions or generic ones, and they take turns until each player has played five. Depending on your class, you'll then get paid by the owners of the companies where your workers are, and these also produce goods and services. Your people may need food, and this is class-specific, where the resource can be either bought or spent from your own reserve. Unfortunately, most classes need to pay tax, and the amount depends on certain political agendas where the state rub their hands as they get the money. Luckily, agendas can change with elections, which uses a pretty slick voting mechanic with bidding, and lastly, each class will earn victory points based on certain criteria from that round. 
During a player's turn, they have a number of cards that can be played for the effect on the card or to take a basic action. Each class has their own specific deck of action cards, so it's impossible to go over all of these for every class, but they essentially allow you to bend the rules of the game, get a bonus for taking a basic action, or provide income and resources, although they are much more detailed than I've explained. So, the work in a middle class can assign workers to companies either for a wage, to produce goods, or both. The workers come in different colours to represent unskilled or skilled workers in a particular industry, and most companies require a specific type. Each round, the immigration deck reveals which workers come into play and the number of cards drawn is dependent on the immigration political agenda in force. If the working class player has multiple workers in a particular industry, they can even assign additional workers to the trade union area on their player board for a few extra victory points at the end of the round. The middle class and capitalists can build companies within their main board sections to entice workers that provide them goods. However, that class then has to pay wages to the owner of the workers employed there. Wages sit at a particular level that the company owner can change, but they must meet the minimum wage requirements set out by the labour market policy. Any goods and services produced by companies from previous turns can be sold to the foreign market in various quantities, and this card will change each round and alter the values. In fact, the middle class gains victory points for each sale they make here, and they can even force their staff to work extra shifts to produce more resources. Capitalists can make important business deals by buying large quantities of resources that are relatively cheap, but they are limited on where they store these goods depending on how they want to use them. They may have to pay a tariff to the state that is set by the foreign trade policy. The state's public companies produce goods that anyone can buy, but their cost is also set by the welfare state policy. Depending on their cost, the state can claim immediate victory points for each sale, or moves class tokens up the legitimacy track on their player boards for end-of-round victory points. They also need to take control of game events that require them spending resources to perform a task of some sort. Again, this can alter legitimacy values for the class involved that can increase or decrease depending on whether the capitalists were able or willing to carry out the set objective. They can also be kind and share influence tokens to other players and provide state benefits, or be an ass and demand immediate tax where each decision affects the end of round victory points. That was just a brief overview of the basic actions of each class, but hopefully you'll start to see where each of them begin to take on separate specific roles. The working class need to get their workers into companies to get money. And this is somewhat true for the middle class, but for different reasons. They can strike if the wage is too low, but this is risky and can also hold demonstrations if there aren't enough companies built. This can result in other players losing victory points, which is nice. Capitalists want workers in their companies to produce resources that can be sold on. They can even upgrade companies for extra produce or develop automated ones that require no wage to be paid. Those damn machines taking our jobs. The middle class lie between the two, but do get victory points for selling goods and obviously don't have to pay themselves if their workers are employed in their own companies. Sounds dodgy. As with the working class, their population level increases with each worker that comes into play, but these become more expensive to feed and require more education and healthcare to thrive. Both the working and middle class can spend healthcare and education resources to increase prosperity, and these earn victory points. This also provides more workers or swaps the generic ones for skilled ones. I got me a degree! Finally, the state. These are looking to keep all other classes happy. They have three tracks to record legitimacy and want to keep these high but balanced. This can be done in numerous ways, such as reducing the cost of public resources, sharing influence, <coughs> bribes, or ensuring events are completed. However, if they tax people or don't complete the card requirements, the other classes don't take too kindly to this. Now, I really like how these actions are linked, even between other classes. For instance, forcing an election to change the immigration agenda produces more workers each round. As a result, more companies need to be built that generate greater resources for the owner or higher wages for the employed. More produce means better value for sale within the foreign market, but a higher tax rate for those players with multiple companies. But this plays out over a number of turns and links seamlessly with very smooth gameplay. Sometimes you have difficult decisions to make. You know what you want to achieve by the end of the round, but you need to get the order of actions in place. Do you play a card for its boosted effect, or take a basic action to prep for your next turn? If you play a basic action, you still have to get rid of a card from hand. But which one? Urgh! Perhaps an action card allows you to propose a bill and carry out an election immediately, but you may want to increase your influence first and therefore run the risk of someone beating you to the punch, and it does happen. During play, all players can place markers on various areas of the political table to change the agenda to suit their needs. 
At the end of the round, an election takes place where you can vote for the change with the possibility of increasing minimum wage or reducing tax pay to the state, as well as earning a few victory points. This election mechanic is done very well because it involves all players and takes into consideration how savvy have you been with your voting cubes and influence. During play, the election bag will gradually fill with voting cubes of each player except the state. For each bill proposed during the round, you'll get to vote for or against, and then carry out an election by drawing five cubes from the bag. Depending on the number and player colour of the cubes and how each class voted, the bill will either pass or remain. All players then get a chance to carry out a secret bidding phase. This requires bluffing, lies and deceit, all to sway the vote in your favour using influence tokens. This is where the state comes in, as they generally have vast quantities of these tokens to spend. If the bill passes, it updates, and then you move to the next proposed bill if needed. This is a great part of the game, but can be time consuming. If a number of bills have been proposed, you're going to have multiple elections, but fear not, as it's a very well thought out part of the game and incredibly engaging. What I like here is that all cubes drawn from the winning side are discarded, whereas those voting cubes of the losing side go back into the bag. This means if there's another bill to vote on, you may have a better chance of success. However, victory points can be earned if those in favour win the vote, so you can even play tactically to claim these if you're not bothered about the outcome. Or, better yet, throw an influence cube in during the secret bid to screw someone over, or stick it to the man. As well as each class having requirements for political agendas, tax and actions, they also have unique ways in which they score victory points. Working class want to create trade unions and use resources to increase people's prosperity. The middle class also want to increase prosperity as well as sell to the foreign market and so do the capitalists as they want to get fatter and richer. This way all classes receive victory points at different stages in the game. So it often looks as though you have a runaway winner in one phase and suddenly they're caught up in the next. This means it's quite hard to determine who's leading the game until the end. At first glance hegemony appears to be a very dry theme. Politics, taxes are not a dragon in sight, but I can say you get drawn into the class that you're playing as very quickly and this generates some great table talk that I think is awesome. There are some rule exceptions you can miss, but this apparent overly complex game becomes very slick with every round you play. You start to see what actions you need to take and your challenge becomes deciding the order that you wish to do them. You'll get stitched up from time to time. Someone beat you to proposing a bill or sold a company where you were banking on the wage. No problem, hold a demonstration. That'll learn them. The expansion, crisis and control also comes with a solo mode. This provides a very well thought out Automa that can be played in one of two ways. In the simple mode, each class comes with a deck of Automa cards that you draw and carry out the first action possible that may result in a bonus. The advanced module, however, adds a whole new level to the Automa where it assigns priorities to every action based on the board state at that time. This looks to become convoluted and time consuming using a host of policy priority cards and I've not actually played that module yet for two reasons. One, this game is big enough and table space becomes limited very quickly. And two, the simple mode works so well that I don't actually see the need to try the advanced mode for solo play. In fact, for solo play, you can even play with multiple automa or boost player count in two or three player games. This is really important because some classes are unavailable at lower player counts. So if you want to play as the state in any game, then just chuck in a few automa players and you're good to go, where it's easy to manage for such a heavy game. Solo play is thoroughly engaging and it really does feel like you're playing against another player. And I think this is a must, even if you just want to add a class or two. This expansion also includes Crisis Response module that changes the actions taken if the state becomes poor and the IMF intervenes. This can lock policies preventing bills from being proposed in the next round, which may change your game plan and you can buy bonds from the state. I think this game is brilliant. I feel I've only scratched the surface of the game in this video as the effects on the action cards are really specific to each class and fully support the development of your people. It's a thinker, a table eater, and there's a lot to take in, but it's so rewarding to see how yours and other class actions play out with a very cool voting mechanic. Don't be scared of the theme. Normally, I like fantasy and sci-fi games, so I was a bit hesitant with hegemony, but boy is it good. It has a lot of player interaction and fairly short turnaround time between turns, which is great for a game of this magnitude. For me, it's certainly worthy of its many awards, as it's a masterpiece, where you kind of learn a little something too. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to the channel.
This is Ninja Geek Games. Cheers.